All right, this is TK Coleman and we are live. Welcome to TK's Two Cents, where I take a couple of tweets and I um, talk a little bit about the context, philosophy behind it, and a little bit of practical application. Today, I wanna to talk with you about the art of being trigger free and also creating without fear. I probably should title that second phrase a little differently, creating without fear, because I don't, I don't know if we ever create without fear. I don't know if fear is ever something that we experience to be absent from life. We create through the fear. So just impose that on what I actually wrote. Being trigger free and creating through the fear. Let's start off with tweet number one. All right, before you respond to it, take a deep breath have a glass of water, go for a walk, reach out to someone you appreciate and show your support, then ask yourself, do I still care about this? Everything seems important when you're in reactive mode. The key is to stay out of that mode. Stay out of that mode. Uh, TK, is it okay if I uh, take two deep breaths or uh, if I drink orange juice instead of water or if I take a, a jog instead of a walk or I like to do the treadmill instead of a walk? If those are the questions you're asking, you're doing it wrong. You're approaching it too legalistic. This isn't school. This isn't a set of prescriptive rules for you to follow. It's about the mindset behind it. So let's talk about the mindset behind it and then we'll zoom back in to the specifics of application. I had a basketball coach in grade school who used to say, don't react act. And what he meant by that was never let the other team dictate your tempo. Instead, know your game and play your game. Understand what your strengths and advantages are. Understand when what you need to do in order to be in a position of optimal performance and play that game and force the other team to react to you. And really, the game is just a competition of seeing who's going to do that most effectively, right? And the winner is the one that compels the other side to react or respond to them. This is what I want to talk about, how to be an actor in the game of life rather than a reactor. Now, life involves elements of both, right? External stimuli is a reality. We can't avoid it. We must react to things. But this is about where your time, energy, and attention is predominantly going. What is the force that governs your life? So there are two fundamentally different approaches to life or two different orientations. There's the reaction response orientation and there's the creative orientation. Let's break them both down. The reaction response orientation is when your time, your energy and your attention is primarily going out in the direction of other people's demands, other people's requests that people are making on you. So if someone says jump, you jump. Or if you don't jump, you spend 10 minutes arguing with them about why you're justified in not jumping. Either way, your energy is primarily in reaction remote mode. Someone else is deciding what you're going to talk about, what you're going to think about, what you're going to do, what you're going to focus on. And they're either pushing you or pulling you in accordance with their agenda and what they're focused on. If you feel like you are always being dominated by others, or you're always in the frenzy state, you're always out of time and, 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 and people are always you know, pulling your strings in some kind of way or triggering you, trolling you, whatever it may be, then that means you are spending most of your time in reaction and response mode. And while reacting and responding to things is a part of life, you are not meant to spend the majority of your existence in that space. If you are, you are guaranteed to be living beneath your, your potential. And more important than anything I think about your potential, you're probably not living a very healthy, happy life. Let's talk about the creative orientation. The creative orientation is when you are the initiator of the sequence of events in your life. The creative orientation is when other things or other people are reacting to you. As I heard someone say before, it's not about things happening to you, it's about you happening to things. So the question you gotta ask yourself, are, does it feel like things are happening to me all the time? Or does it feel like I'm happening to things most of the time? And whether you are a leader by title or position or not, you got to be the leader of your own life. And being the leader of your own life means that you are taking charge of your energies. You are the one that's deciding the direction in which your energies will flow. I heard Charlemagne the God say, most people, they wake up in the morning and they go to social media to decide what they should care about. It's a terrible way to live because that means someone else is in control of your energy. And that means you are being manipulated. 
Now, being manipulated isn't necessarily this nefarious, cautiously done thing. When people manipulate you, that doesn't mean they intend to manipulate you. When you're being manipulated, that doesn't mean that someone is trying to do it. It just means somebody is in control of your energy other than you. Somebody's controlling your time. Somebody's controlling your energy. Somebody's controlling your attention. I got an acronym, T. I like that. Somebody's controlling that and you're not the one. You got to get out of that mode, got to get out of that mode. So this isn't about a set of rules that says, hey, man, you can't argue on the Internet or it's always wrong, no matter what the conditions are to ever reply to people or respond to people or explain yourself to people. No, that's nonsense. That's a legalistic mindset. It's about saying, hey, if you are feeling like you're drained, you're stressed out, you're tired all the time, you're bitter and you're resentful because somebody else is controlling your energy, then you're doing it wrong. You have the power to switch things up. All right, let's bring it back to this tweet. Because in real life, we tend to have an easier time doing this. Well, what I mean is in physical space. Usually when you're around people, people talk differently in person than they do online. They interact differently in person than they do online because there's just more at stake. Being in physical proximity to someone requires you to own your behavior a little bit more. There's more risk involved. But a lot of times we go online, we let people waste our time. We let people dictate our energy in all kinds of ways. And then we find ourselves being like flustered and frustrated in ways that we don't want to be. It's like that cat meme. You ever seen that cat meme where you like that giffy where he's typing real fast because he feels the need to respond to everybody and explain himself to everybody. A lot of people live in, in that mode. And the key to getting out of that mode and getting into the creative orientation is creating space between the stimulus and the response. When somebody says something to you, When somebody requests something of you, take five minutes or five seconds, whatever you have, it doesn't have to be instantaneous. There is a real space between the stimulants and response. Allow yourself the opportunity to get into that space and then line up with your preferences, your principles, your priorities, and decide how you're going to respond to this from a place of power. And that may involve not having a response at all. So when I say take a deep breath, I don't mean that you have to do that. I don't care if you take a deep breath or not. When I say have a glass of water, I don't care if it's a glass of orange juice or a glass of nothing at all. When I say go for a walk, I don't mean I don't care if you go play Tetris or go on a treadmill. I don't care what you do. It's really about looking for something to do other than responding to something that seems present in the moment. Because if the thing you're tempted to respond to is actually important, if it really demands your time, energy, and attention, guess what? It's going to still be there. It's going to still be there. If you do those things, you take a deep breath, you have a glass of water, you go for a walk. If it's really important, it's going to still be there and you can respond to it then. In most of these cases where we feel tempted to react and respond to somebody, there's no expiration date. There's no expiration date. So give yourself some time and then ask yourself, do I still care about it? Because you'll often find when you get yourself into a different frame of mind, you come back to things and you say, man, I don't even care about this. This ain't even a big deal. And if you do still care about it, guess what? You can respond. You don't lose anything in the process. But that's how you become trigger free. Becoming trigger free isn't about becoming some kind of, you know, um, super enlightened being who doesn't experience emotion in response to the things that people say, do, and demand. Being trigger-free means that you feel those things, you have emotional experiences, but you are not a slave to your emotional experiences. You don't feel the need to go, I got to react right away uh, because I'm feeling the emotion. No, you can can step back for a second and you say, yeah, I'm feeling all of this. I'm feeling all this. I'm even feeling upset. I feel like I want to give a response. I feel like I want to, you know, go at them. But you acknowledge that you can, you can take some time. You can take some time. What are your preferences? What are your principles? What are your priorities? If all of those things are in agreement with you responding, go ahead and respond to your heart's delight and enjoy yourself. Have fun. Don't regret. Don't complain because you said that was your priority. But if it's not, then you can move on to do something else and the world will continue to go. That's how you choose to be trigger free. Don't try to be someone who has no feelings. Don't try to be someone who is too tough to experience emotion. There's nothing tough about that. That's just being pretentious, which is really a sign of weakness, not toughness. But it's about giving yourself time to process your emotions in a healthy way, not being reactive, but being an actor. And that's how you live inside the creative orientation. That's how you get out of reacting in response to everybody, be in control of your own time.
Don't let people manipulate you. Don't don't participate in conversations and interactions that you don't want to be in. Don't be a slave to that. And don't be afraid of <laughs> saying no. Don't be afraid of ignoring people. All right, let's go to the next one. My two-step process on how to create, how to become a great creator. Step one, create. Step two, learn how to create. Kind of backwards, right? My favorite definition of learning, Chalmers Brothers in the book called Language and the Pursuit of Happiness. And he says, learning is the art of doing what you don't know how to do while you don't know how to do it. Learning isn't, I'm gonna read all the books on it first, I'm gonna study up on it first, I'm gonna listen to 50 different podcasts, I'm gonna become an expert on it first, and then I'm gonna be real good, and then I'm gonna go out there and do it. It's not what learning is. Learning is, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm going to try to do it, even though I don't know what I'm doing and I know I'm gonna fail and make some mistakes and probably look stupid a little bit. And that process of actually engaging the activity is going to teach me something. And then when I go read, when I go listen to podcasts, when I go research, when I go reflect, that those activities are going to be meaningful because I have some substance to contemplate. Okay, let's think about it this way. A lot of times we're conditioned to think about the cre- about creativity as if it's a success-oriented process. It is a process that's all about getting it right. And if you see creativity as only a success-oriented process, guess what? You're going to be stressed out all the time because you're going to feel like there's always something at stake every time you create something. You get ready to compose a song. You get ready to make a video. You got to make sure you look perfect. You got to make sure you're in a great mood. You got to make sure all of your words are just so preciously planned. You can't afford to stutter. You can't afford to have any hiccups or any sound problems. Everything's got to be right. Why? Because you've already presupposed that creativity is a success oriented process. And when you're following that kind of process, failure is a bad thing. Let me give you an alternative take on creativity. It's not just a success oriented process. It is a discovery oriented process. What does that mean? That means the goal of creativity isn't to demonstrate that I have arrived. It isn't to demonstrate that I am perfect. It is not to get on a mountaintop and say, everybody, I've figured out creativity. I am a fully actualized human being. So I'm gonna do some stuff so y'all can experience the blessings of sitting at the feet of my mastery. No, no. Purpose of creativity is to say, I'm enthusiastic about life, about my own potential. I love to learn. I am insatiably curious. And I'm going to create something because that is how I find out things that I didn't already know. And so when you approach creativity as a process of discovery, you're always winning. Because even when you create something that ain't that good, you're still winning because you're coming out smarter and more competent every time. There's this um, uh, anecdote that I heard some time ago about an art teacher. I don't know if it's true. I don't care if it's true. Please don't send me some kind of like, TK, uh, this is an experiment that uh, never occurred before because it's a useful fiction if it's not true. It's an analogy. It's an illustration. It's like how you can watch a movie that ain't real and learn a lesson from it. That, we're going to do that right now. So this is art teacher. Had two different groups of students. The first group of students, they were judged by um, how well the one piece of art they created was. So they were judged by quality. They had one drawing to do, and if they did it really well, they get an A. If they do it kind of well, a B, and so on. The second group, they were judged by quantity. How many drawings did they produce? So if they produce two drawings, they don't get a good grade. If they produce 10, they get a better grade. 20, they get an A. It don't even matter if those drawings are bad. Over time, the second group, the group that was judged on quantity, showed greater progress. Their, the quality of their creativity improved while the people that just focused on doing one and getting everything right, they pretty much stayed at the same level. And why is that? The reason why is because the group that was judged on quantity, they were fearless. They didn't obsess over making mistakes. They just kept creating and creating and creating. And when you involve yourself in the particip- in, in when you involve yourself in the creative process and you're not freaking out all the time about being perfect, you get really good at things. You just get better. There's no way for you to not get better when you just show up and do it. Even when you don't feel pretty, even when you don't feel cute, even when you don't feel smart or inspired, you learn how to manufacture your own inspiration. You learn how to be competent. And you know what? You incentivize your brain to process information in a way that is constructive because when you know you got to show up, 
you pay attention to the world differently than when you know you have an out. So if you want to be a good creator, stop trying to read one more book. Stop trying to plan one more day. Just start creating, even if it's not that good. And that's how you'll eventually get better. And yes, by the way, all the creators that you love and respect and admire, there was a point, if you rewind the clock, where they weren't that good. And guess what? Nobody cares because they're good now. When you produce something that's worth sharing, when you produce something that has a positive impact on people, nobody's going to go, oh, I don't care that this has a positive impact on me because when that guy first started, he wasn't that good. No. Nah. Don't be precious. Don't be overdramatic about the creative process. Get out there. Share what you have to offer. Not because I need it, but because you need it. To be creative is what it means to be human. And that's how you become fully alive. That's how you become fully human. You got to create. So get out there and try the creative process. All right, y'all. That's it. Those are the two tweets for the day. Those are TK's two cents. I hope it helps. Feel free to hit the like button. Comment. Tell me something that you learn. Feel free to ask me any questions about things that you like to talk about in the future. Hit the subscribe and follow Revolution of One. Also, check me out at fee.org slash rev1. Follow me on Instagram official TK Coleman. Follow me on Twitter at TK underscore Coleman. I hope you can go forth and be trigger free and I, can, and I hope you can create through the fear. Peace.